Dear all, me direct thanks you for joining this webinar, the 15th in our MeDirect talk series, where we aim to introduce you to financial experts and asset managers, so that they can share their views on the financial markets and investment opportunities with you. For this edition, we have partnered up with Fundsmit Equity Fund. Terry Smith will be giving an update on the performance of the fund, together with his views on the financial world and the current trends. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar with Terry Smith and the Fundsmith Equity Fund. Before I hand you over to Terry, the format for today is there will be a presentation which should last roughly about 30 minutes, followed by some Q&A. We will endeavour to answer as many as possible. Um, if your question isn't answered, we will get in touch with you after the webinar uh, later on today with an answer. So with nothing further to say, I'm going to hand you over to Terry Smith to present to you today. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Peter. There's our disclaimer, which as you know, we're required to uh, to show you and which you should take the trouble to read. Uh, keep us going from there, though. Thank you. Uh, performance, probably the single most important thing for most people to focus on. A difficult period, uh, as we can see, the uh, the fund was down 17.8 percent. That's the, uh, the T class uh, accumulation for the first half of, of this year, by far our worst performance. Also, our worst relative performance. You can see there the MSCI was off 11.3 percent during this period, so we actually underperformed uh, the index by about six and a half percent, quite a margin, um, and obviously much worse than we've had historically. Uh, bonds are off 7.1 percent during the same period, so. Uh, just about everything except possibly energy stocks uh, was down during this period. Um, and whilst uh, it's never welcome to have a period of underperformance, clearly, um, it's equally inevitable. We've never made any bones about the fact that we expect our uh, strategy to underperform at some point and we expect to lose money and quite possibly both at the same time as we've had here uh for it there's no strategy that performs in every reporting period in every market condition uh, and if there was the uh, the influx of money into that uh, forever outperforming strategy would quickly arbitrage away any possible opportunity but anyway we'll uh, perhaps say a bit more about the background to all this and how we feel about it uh, as i go along or as your questions come in uh, what worked and what didn't Let's just deal with what worked well first in terms of the largest contributors uh, probably the only two which i would single out for mention are philip morris our best performer, tobacco stock. Um, I wouldn't particularly attribute this to the defensive qualities of tobacco companies, which have historically always been one of their features. I would say it's more the fact that Philip Morris has become the undoubted leader in the heat not burn category of, of reduced risk products with their ICOS system, um, and also has tabled a bid for Swedish Match, uh, which is the leader in, uh, in nicotine pouches, so uh, tobacco-less nicotine pouches. And I think the, there is a possibility that uh, uh, in doing so, they are correctly predicting and indeed creating the future of, of this industry and that it will go into reduced harm products for smokers in terms of eat not burn and nicotine products which have no tobacco at all for those who just want to use nicotine but don't want uh, the risks of using tobacco. Um, and so yeah, it's performed well and I'm pleased it's performed well. I always think that in uh, in almost any endeavour in life you can tell um, uh, the right thing to do by what some people who are great negative indicators do. So any number of um, uh, NGOs and government bodies are somewhat anti the uh, the development of uh, of um, reduced risk products by people like Philip Morris and Swedish Match, um, which almost certainly says it's the right way to go in terms of reducing harm to smokers, which I think is genuinely their aim now. Uh, Novo Nordisk, our second biggest best performer. Um, Novo is the world leader in the treatment of diabetes. Um, they've had great success with uh, a drug called semaglutide, which is a, a form of, of treatment for diabetes. Um, and that in itself has been a great success, but they've also alighted upon the fact that it has a very strong secondary use. And they've now got basically licensed by the FDA and increasingly by other regulators, the world's first effective weight loss drug, in it, uh, which has been uh, rebranded Wagavi uh, in terms of labeling for that use. Uh, a course of, uh, of Wagavi leads to a loss of about one sixth of, of body mass uh, for users. And I think that's uh, obviously a great leap forward for them. Um, the other thing that uh, is possible, though, um, uh, and uh, we won't know the outcome of this for some while yet, is in looking at the clinical data from the testing of the semaglutide, they've discovered that it looks like it's the first effective um, treatment to pre 
prevent the deterioration caused by Alzheimer's, uh, which obviously would be another tremendous breakthrough drug. So uh, they've obviously done extremely well during this period. I won't dwell on the others, Brown Foreman, uh, distiller of Jack Daniels uh, and other uh, spirits, including tequila. Uh, PepsiCo, which reported yesterday, might come back to them when we discuss inflation and Waters, the uh, uh, testing equipment company, which has done very well for us. What didn't work, uh, as you said, the numbers are obviously bigger on these. Um, really, these fall into two camps. Um, those that have got fundamental issues, and I would single out PayPal and Meta, uh, the old Facebook in that regard. Both of them have run headfirst into uh, issues. In the case of PayPal, I think self-inflicted issues caused by uh, a lack of attention to um, uh, more engagement with users and lack of attention to costs, uh, and quite possibly having edged themselves away from being a disruptor in payments towards being maybe one of the disrupted, which is worrying, um, and meta in terms of Facebook, where there's obviously a, a deafening amount of, of noise uh, around the sort of the regulatory uh, aspects of, of, of this business, combined with the fact that they've announced a very big investment to uh, to build the uh, the hardware, software, and platform for the so-called metaverse, for uh, uh, an, uh, an advanced um, uh, artificial reality uh, system uh, for this. And, um, uh, both of those stocks, um, are, I think, are, are interesting insofar as not only have they obviously had a poor performance, but their rating has descended to the point where both of them are now included in the value subsector of the index. Um, and whereas normally I might be sitting applauding that, I suppose to some degree I am, uh, I'm equally worried about it because I, I think buying things purely on their valuation is not what we're about. We need to remain satisfied that they're going to produce medium to long-term good fundamental performance. Um, most of the remainder of what we see on these detractors is really about valuation, IDEX and Microsoft in particular. Neither of them have had any fundamental problems in the business, far from it. In fact, it's really just the effect of long tail assets suffering disproportionately during a period of expected and actual rising uh, interest rates. Insure is a bit of a middle ca middling case. It's got quite a high rating of suffered on that. It's also, we think, made at least one misstep in capital allocation. It bought MailChimp, the uh, online marketing business, uh, pretty much at the peak of valuations for, check, for tech, paid about $12 billion. And I suppose if you were being generous, which I don't feel at the moment, then you would probably say, well, that's just a, a problem of timing, uh, which they've got wrong. But I, I'm not actually satisfied that it's a particularly good acquisition. But I guess time will tell for us in that regard. Um, I hope by now you're familiar with the strategy, but as ever with these things, I think it's good to remind ourselves and sort of um, try and figure out whether we're sticking to what we said we're going to do. Only invest in good companies, try not to overpay and then do nothing. Let's briefly take you through each of those. Number one, invest only invest in good companies. That's a look through table, which we show you every year in our annual letter in which we take the operating and financial characteristics on a few key metrics of our businesses in our portfolio, tell you how they waited for the size of the holdings, how it would pan out as a look through from our units into those companies if we were holding them as a, as a normal holding company rather than a, a mutual fund. Um, and then we compare them with the major indices uh, that we can get data on the S&P and the FTSE. Um, this is obviously the year end for one for last year. We don't update this more than annually because simply um, you would get too many seasonal effects for one thing in doing so. Plus in a year like this where you've got obviously highly volatile um, uh, macroeconomic conditions compared to history, um, I think you might get some very false indications if you were to do it on a rolling 12 months. But as you're probably familiar with, we own companies which have significantly higher ROC or return on capital employed than the index companies, much higher gross margins, which is a number I want to uh, come back to in terms of the discussion of inflation, higher profit margins, and typically better cash conversion, although not in the last year, um, but that was a bit of a peculiarity of, of it being a ratio. For the index companies, basically, uh, their stocks and collectibles uh, fell, uh, their um, pay um, receivables, fell faster than their, than their um, than their sales did um, with the number of supply chain disruptions and stock outs, which I think is a very temporary effect, which will reverse. And then interest cover. These are very conservatively financed companies with 23 times interest cover uh, versus about eight or nine times for the index. So look, that's still roughly the picture at the moment as far as we can tell. Um, but obviously we will update that when we get the full year in and we've got half a year yet to run on that, which is gonna be a very interesting half a year, I suspect. Don't overpay. Um, easily the most vexed part of this strategy has been almost from inception and continues to have been so. Um, the fall in uh, in price that we've had uh, for a number of our securities and obviously for our units 
has uh, started to correct the valuation that we had uh, insofar as our valuation is now, we think, we guesstimate back to about a 3.6% uh, free cash flow. You're pretty much very close to being in line with the S&P 500, as you can see there. Still a lot more expensive than the FTSE, but uh, I think you know by now my views on the FTSE are that the quality of the companies involved don't really bear a great deal of comparison. So far as we can calculate at the moment at the mid-year, and this is not a number that we particularly like to rely on too heavily because of what I said before, which is seasonal effects and, uh, and macroeconomic change, the free cash flow for the, the rolling 12 months going into the 3rd of June was growing at about 18% per annum, which is a hell of a clip, uh, basically, and certainly makes that kind of rating look feasible uh, in terms of its uh, uh, fundamental sustainability. I think that free cash flow is going to come down, however, in the second half of the year. I don't think it's going to go into reverse. Um, and in fact, it may not even get into single digits, but I think it's going to come down significantly with the kind of uh, macroeconomic effects uh, that we're seeing. Um, for what it's worth, I, know, I noticed one or two of the press picked this up. Um, our valuation is um, now back to where it was in about 2017 in portfolio terms. So we've lost about five years in terms of the valuation of the portfolio during the first six months of this year. Um, what did we do in our do nothing as ever with these things? I'll go on to show you in a moment a slide which shows you the amount of money we spent, which is minimal, frankly. The number of names is quite often makes it look like we're doing a lot more than the actual portfolio turnover is partly because when we sell things have quite often become a small part of the portfolio. We sold two stocks and bought two stocks in the first half. We sold J&J, &J, Johnson and Johnson, and we sold Starbucks. Uh, J&J is a company that's done OK for us, um, but it's really a three legged stool or probably more like uh, uh, one and two halves, which is to say it's got a drug business, um, a, a, a medical devices business and, a, and an over the counter consumer health business. And we really bought this company, ironically, for the medical equipment and devices business and the um, uh, over the counter uh, consumer health business. And very ironically, it's the drugs business which has performed well, whereas they perform quite poorly in the two businesses we bought them for, which we've never liked, uh, basically. And um, they are uh, had a good run in drugs, which has helped to support them, notwithstanding our views. Uh, we wonder how long that can be sustained, for one thing. Um, uh, and secondly, they are doing a spin out of the consumer health. And um, we would have understood if the company were doing a spin out where they were going three ways for drugs, uh, medical equipment devices and, and consumer health. But they're actually spinning out consumer health and keeping the other two businesses, which seems to us to be a bit of a, a halfway house in terms of what we think they should have done. I mean, really, you'll know if you listen to us or read about us long enough, are we big fans of spin outs as a great way of creating value for businesses? But in this particular case, we were reasonably convinced that it was the right way forward. The medical equipment and devices business in particular acquired a business that we liked a lot called Synthes, uh, a trauma equipment business, and appears to us to have not made a very good fist of running it. Uh, and we say that because we've got a very clear a comparator in our portfolio in Striker, which has done much better over the period. So the combination of those factors, heavy reliance on the drug portfolio, thinking it may not continue, um, the fact that they're doing a partial spin out and not a complete spin out, meant we thought there was better opportunity elsewhere. And we also sold Starbucks. Starbucks, you may recall, we acquired uh, about two years ago in the, the sort of bottom of the, uh, the pandemic downturn when it was off about 40%. Um, we thought we foresaw a great opportunity in Starbucks for it to do a couple of things, apart from the share price fall being attractive for us. One was its second biggest market and its biggest growth market is China. And its biggest competitor in China, Luckin Coffee, had been exposed as a fraud by the events of the pandemic, really. And um, we thought they had a great opportunity to capitalize upon that situation. And also only about half of the Starbucks estate is franchised. And we thought we saw uh, an opportunity to liberate capital and, re and, and put up the already significant return on capital by further franchising of the estate. Um, the management has completely stubbed its toe, basically. And um, there's been an unscheduled change of chief executive. Howard Schultz has come back. Uh, they've also fired the head of the North American operation. Um, and uh, and they got rid of the head of uh, um, human HR in, uh, in North America because of a unionization push, which uh, they seem to have handled quite badly. Um, and most importantly for us, they not, not only failed to capitalize upon the Chinese opportunity, but they appear to have allowed Luckin back onto uh, back into the contention uh, in the whole matter. So we were very disappointed with their execution of what we saw uh, as the opportunity. On the other hand, we thought we saw some opportunity on the other side here in the purchases. Um, we bought Adobe. Adobe is a company that we've always liked. 
Um, it's basically, as you, I'm sure you know, the the leader in the in the supply of software for graphics and uh, and creative illustration. Um, also has a growing online advertising business, and we thought that the rating had got back to a point where it looked attractive to us during the downturn in tech stocks that we've experienced in the first half of this year. And the other company bought was Metla Toledo that you might not be familiar with. It's uh, the probably the world leader in terms of measuring equipment, particularly weighing equipment for use in commercial applications and laboratories. It does a number of other uh, laboratory and, and biopharmaceutical manufacturing applications, things like mass pipetting and so on, um, an extremely uh, tidily run uh, business, basically, we've uh, long admired. And, uh, and so we took the opportunity to, uh, to get on board that. Um, what did we amount to in terms of turnover? Uh, you see on here, we've got the, the 2021 numbers. We haven't got the first half of, of this year, but uh, when you get the numbers, you'll see that the portfolio turnover rate is actually comparable uh, with what we're saying we had in 2021, which was 5.6%. The actual amount of turnover is uh, is quite low. Uh, and uh, I think you'll see when we get to the year end, even if we do one or two other things, and who knows, it's really a amount of opportunity and, and what it presents to us, uh, we will be well in line with uh, the kind of historic numbers that you'll see in there of 5% uh, or so. Um, obviously, we've had a rotation into value stocks to some degree during the, the last six to uh, eight or nine months. Um, and we've not performed as well as, as some of those uh, uh, value stocks quite clearly. And if you look at what's happened in the first half, you can see uh, the Nasdaq off 21%, the S&P growth uh, component is in off 20, us off 17.8, the actual S&P in total off 11, um, the Dow, which is much more heavily into value, off 4.9. An awful lot of the stuff that's value, though, missing out on it doesn't make us feel too bad. You can see banks, which we'll never own, off 16%. And airlines, which we equally will never own, off 13%. Really, the only things that did any great damage here uh, were metals and mining, which was up 8.6. But the real um, big one is uh, is energy, which is up 46.3%, which, uh, as I'm sure you know by now, is a sector we're never going to own, uh, basically. So, you know, even if one can predict that these things are likely to happen in terms of $100 plus oil prices, it's not going to be one we're going to revisit. And that's because... You know, it has its day in the sun or this month, it's six months in the sun. And for all I know, it's going to have a whole year in the sun and maybe even more than a whole year in the sun. But it doesn't it's not an industry that actually creates value. Um, it doesn't have adequate returns on capital and growth opportunities to create value. That move in the energy index uh, that you see there took the U.S. energy stocks back up to the level that they were at just before the financial crisis in 2008. And in the case of the U.K. major energy stocks of so BP and Shell, it took them back up to a level they were at in the 1990s. Um, you know, if you really were sitting there waiting for this opportunity to rotate into the sector that's produced most of the uh, of the performance for value during this period, you would have missed out on a decade or even a, a quarter of a century of performance from waiting. And you can see that if you look over to the right hand side, basically, you can see there, there we are in terms of uh, since inception up 451. Uh, you can see the S&P 429%. And then you can see where we are with the, the remainder of these, the energy index up 134%. You know, it's um, it's not a long term strategy to place things. If you've got the uh, ability to do it in terms of uh, your ability to predict uh, your stomach for owning these things and you're sufficiently fleet of foot in terms of liquidity to uh, to grasp them, uh, good for you. But we're not even going to try for all of those reasons. Is tech highly rated? The other thing that we've heard an awful lot about is the derating of tech during this period. Well, um, if you have a look at the rating of tech at the moment, if you have a look at the free cash flow yield, which is the um, the metric that we uh, turn to, which we think is the best acid test of valuation, least easily manipulated, um, and the one that in the long term really does correlate best with movements in stock prices, you see that the 78 tech stocks which are in the S&P 500 index, the medium free cash flow yield is 4.3%, and the average is actually 5%. Um, if you look at the 35 consumer staple stocks in the in the same index, their median is 4% and their average is 4.9%. Hey, tech on average is cheaper than consumer staples now. I mean, perhaps not surprisingly, because consumer staples obviously have more defensive qualities. You might speculate than tech stocks, although I would wonder about that in terms of the sort of technology that we focus upon um, being uh, defensive. But whichever it is, the fact of the matter is, Tech, in the terms of the tech that's in the S and P 500, which is what we own essentially, it is no longer can be no longer categorised as relatively expensive. 
Um, here's a, a quick list of some of our tech stocks. As you can see from what I was saying, it is the S&P at 18. 0.5 times PE. Um, you can see that Meta and PayPal uh, are sub the index, which is why they're now in the value uh, subsector. Then you can see the rest of our tech stocks there, uh, Alphabet on 19, 20 times, Adobe on 27, Microsoft on 27, Visa on 27, etc. I mean, the only ones where it starts to look really kind of interesting versus the NASDAQ are Amadeus, where obviously we are in potentially at least a recovery play. Uh, where well, I don't think we've uh, we've seen the whole of the recovery in air travel yet, not likely to with things like capacity constraints at uh, UK airports and lockdowns in China. Um, but I think that's probably not a genuine long term rating. And Amazon, which is clearly an outlier in base in, in terms of the massive spend that they've gone through uh, recently, which is depressed earnings. But if you look back at the remainder, they're all sub the Nasdaq and, and a number of them gravitate towards the S&P 500. So we don't own very much very expensive stuff. And I would have said most of what I can see there, if not all of what I can see there, such as Adobe, Microsoft, Visa, ADP, uh, are really pretty much justified by the fundamental growth I can see in, in top line sales and bottom line free cash flows. Um, the impact of inflation. We've got inflation. Uh, I'm sure some or all of you will have seen before you came on the uh, the, the webinar uh, that the US CPI has just come out at 9.1 percent. Q uh, panic uh, uh, and so on. Here's uh, an illustration of what we think is defensive about our portfolio and, uh, and and the sort of thing that we seek to avoid. Target, the US retailer, recently had its uh, um, uh, quarterly figures for Q1. 2022 in its fiscal year. And you can see at the top there, sales grew by 4%, not bad actually. Gross margins slipped by 4.3% or 430 bips. A uh, combination of things in terms of supply chain costs, uh, increased costs in, uh, in their warehousing operations, sale of uh, fewer discretionary high margin items, the usual kind of raft of things that you might think would affect a retailer in inflation. The operating margin dropped by an extremely similar 450 basis points, so almost at the same number. And the net result was operating profits down by 43% and the stock down by 25%. Um, and this is a pretty good retailer, by the way, in my view. I think Target is, is up there in terms of the top uh, sort of handful at worst of, of retailers that I've ever looked at. Um, now, they haven't got the actual numbers yet for uh, L'Oreal, so these I'm afraid are theoretical, but I think when we get the actual numbers, they'll be better than this. I've just assumed that the same thing happens to L'Oreal, and I'd be pre prepared to have a bet that something a lot better than, uh, than this happens to L'Oreal. Sales up 4%. By the way, I think they'll beat that, so I'll take the same as target. Gross margins down by 430 bits. I don't think there's any chance that the gross margin will go down by 430 bits. Operating margin down by 450 bips, even if the gross margin did go down by 430 bips, I don't think the operating margin would go down by 450 bips because they've got such a large gap in between on which to operate on their cost base. That I don't think that's too likely. But anyway, just assuming they don't manage to achieve anything better than the target performance in terms of changes. The operating profit only falls 21 percent, about half the target level for a very simple reason. You know, the gross margin is a lot higher. They are making things for 26 and selling them for 100. Um, our friends at Target are buying things in for 70 and selling them for 100. It's it's a much better position to be in. And if you look at the look through table that we did there and just average it and take the same calculation, sales from 100 to 104. 4%. Gross margin, you can see down by 430 bips to 59.7%. Operating margin, 450 bips. Total fall, 14%. We've got some pretty high margin businesses uh, in there. Not only our cosmetics businesses, but also our software businesses are very high margin uh, businesses. And this is the first line of defense uh, in terms of inflation. I mean, I've been through inflationary periods earlier in my career, and, uh, and I know what they feel and look like. Um, and, um, you know, you might not be very happy if you've got 14 percent profit for I'm not, um, but you'd be an awful lot happier than 43 uh, percent. That's for sure. And, you know, we are in a situation We had the, the first numbers out of the earnings season yesterday for uh, PepsiCo, which is one of our holdings. Sales are up 13 percent and 12 percent of that was from price. Now, I'm not very happy about that because I like people to sell more of something. Um, you know, there's an old uh, sort of calculation or line which goes, you know, if you own a, a Pepsi shell for, share for a dollar um, and it goes to a dollar 15 cents and at the same time a can of Pepsi goes from a dollar to a dollar 15 cents you might feel richer but you're not any richer because you haven't made any real money with which to pay for the can of Pepsi and um, and so you know that's kind of not good but it's better than the alternative. I mean, in, in circumstances such as we now face, somebody who can put up their prices by 12 percent, 
and still generate 1% volume growth is quite a defensive stock in relative terms in relation to the remainder of the world. Um, TINA, uh, an acronym that you may or may not come across, uh, and I've sort of touched upon it there. Uh, we're in an inflationary period. Um, I've got no great crystal ball into how long or how bad it will be. Um, I mean, I'm not optimistic, um, but then I really am optimistic, actually, as my colleagues will tell you. Um, but I think there's a chance that given that it appears to have been born not by excessive demand, um, but by supply chain disruption and incorrect monetary policy, that it could disappear uh, as rapidly as it appeared. Um, in fact, one of the great theories of life is that, uh, is that monetary policy is always either too lax or too tight, and it definitely was too lax. And of course, what we may find in a relatively short space of time, if the supply chain begins to correct and demand does drop uh, as a result of rising interest rates, is it's then become too tight. Uh, but what I do know is this, in periods such as this, whilst owning something like Pepsi, which we do, it isn't great because 1% volume growth um, isn't terrific. Um, it's it actually better than owning most other things. You're owning bonds in this period uh, is not great. Fairly obviously, owning cash is even worse. I mean, I, I you know, at the, I, I, last time I had a look, uh, the, uh, you know, I could go and buy uh, a short term bond on uh, on a yield of about 2.2 to 2.4% uh, in the US um, to park my money in. Um, with inflation running at 9%, that's not a great trade. Uh, basically. So as much as this may be a very painful period, it may be that um, we're in the best alternative there is out there. I think that's it, isn't it, Hugo? I think it's the end of the slides. Yeah, it is. Over to you, if I may. OK, thank you very much, Tony. That was very interesting. Um, we do have a number of questions. Um, we have quite a few on PayPal and Meta. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> yeah. um, and we actually have completely opposite questions. So I'm going to ask you one question, but it's two different answers. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to do uh, the answers so, as well, Pete. You do the answers too. <laughs> so, so one half of the one half of the question is: given the valuation decline, should you be adding more? And the other side of the question is: if the fundamentals are so bad, have you considered selling? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, with regard to the valuation decline and adding more, I am disinclined to add more at the moment in either of them. Um, I, and I, by the way, I, didn't, I don't think I said the fundamentals are bad. What I said was, I think in the case of PayPal, I think there've been some management missteps that the management have shown themselves to be uh, not able to grasp in, increased engagement with the increased number of users that they've got from the, uh, the pandemic. And uh, that they've actually been too focused on this thing about getting more up the funnel to get more uh, input in terms of bidding, uh, potentially bidding for Pinterest and things like that. And that's under people and their cost control has not been great. So there's a number of ding, ding, ding. And the fundamentals are terrible by any means. I think this company is probably going to finish the year growing up. 15% at least, maybe a bit more. Um, so I'm not sure that the fundamentals are that bad with a, quite an adequate return on capital. So I'm not sure it's that bad. Um, but, you know, I'm not inclined to add to it when the management of, uh, in my view, made some mistakes. Um, and by the way, I, I know it's the end of the world if management make mistakes. I make plenty of them um, and uh, so on. Uh, the main thing about making mistakes is what did you learn? And what are you going to do differently because you made a mistake? And uh, what I would say in, in answer on the PayPal one is we have a heavy level of engagement at the moment to try and satisfy ourselves whether or not the OK fundamentals uh, are combined with a management which has learned something and therefore it might be worthwhile buying more, but not until we've actually become satisfied about that, I must say. Now, with regard to Meta, I'm not sure what the fundamentals are. I think the main problems of Meta are not born of fundamentals. Uh, they're born of, of regulatory action stroke noise um, and uh, and this uh, rather large investment, which they've announced in a new um, line of engagement with people in, in terms of the metaverse. And I guess with regard to the latter, we are uncertain what it means. I mean, one might even be uncertain what the metaverse is, but I think we're beginning to get greater insight into it, partly because they're not the only person engaged in, in trying to develop it. But what we're not clear about is what we're going to get out of it. I mean, if, if, if Meta were sitting there with just their digital advertising business, which did about $117 uh, billion of, uh, of revenue in the last full year, with a, an operating profit margin of a 40% or something like that. If they only had that, 
I would probably be in there buying more right now, uh, but it's not all they have right now. Um, uh, you know, they've got this other investment, which we've got to try and weigh in the balance, which wasn't part of what we bought into in the first place. So I, I'm not, I mean, I don't think the fundamentals are getting better at Meta, by the way, because you know, they are in a, not quite a duopoly, but nearly a duopoly with uh, uh, with uh, Alphabet in, in online advertising. And I would have thought the online advertising market is going to go through a cyclical downturn now, along with most everything else. So it's not the fundamentals are terrific, but I don't think they're particularly bad. We'll let you know when we get some figures out of them. Um, it's just I don't know about this other thing that they're doing and what its economics are at the moment. Uh, you know, the, the $10 billion they talked about spending on it, I don't know whether it's actually going to be ten billion dollars, and I don't know how many other people are going to be spending on it. I know some people who've sort of thrown their hat in the ring, who say they will, but there's some who are notoriously quiet, like Apple at the moment. So I don't know how many people are going to be playing in here. I don't know how many, uh, if any, winners we're going to have, and what the shape of the the revenue and profit opportunity will be. So it's got a higher level of uncertainty than would lead me to invest more at the moment, um, and actually a higher level of uncertainty than I like dealing with in companies, to be blunt. Thanks, Terry. Um, more generally on tech companies, um, mm. what's your thoughts on the impact of stock based compensation? Uh, well, stock based compensation is uh, kind of an inevitable in the, in the sector or the subsector because of the nature of the business and the way in which it's developed. Um, but we are always we try and look at companies taking out stock based compensation from the calculation of uh, a free cash flow, because although it's not a cash item, the fact of the matter is, if you didn't do it, you'd have to pay people more. So we tend to look at not our own. Uh, we look at our own calculation of just about anything, really, uh, although some of the numbers on Bloomberg are pretty good for a lot of things. But whatever it is, including free cash flow and return on capital, we look at numbers in which we take out items like that because we think that it's an expense of doing business. Um, I suppose if we were wrong about that and you could be more positive about stock based compensation, you might say, well, it is a cost of doing business. But when you get through periods where everybody doesn't get it because of uh, things like stock price declines and so on, um, then maybe uh, there isn't a bit away for people and they're genuinely it's not replaced by cash cost. And I'm, that's an argument. Um, it's not one I'm necessarily prepared to believe uh, at the moment, but it is an argument. Thanks. Um, you mentioned PepsiCo earlier on. Um, we have a question on how do you see Unilever performing in this environment? And is mm. it still worth holding? Yeah, I, I think I've probably said more publicly than uh, than is good in some respects on, on Unilever, although we, we weren't trying to court publicity. I should say that the remarks that I we made were in answer to, que to questions from uh, uh, investors, not unlike this one that I'm getting here, uh, which is you know, why do you still hold Unilever? I mean, Unilever is 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 sort of a company that's producing 13 or 14 percent return on capital employed and historically it has done 20 percent plus. So looking back at that, can it recapture that? I don't know. Um, I think the positive is pretty simple. It's called Nelson Peltz. You know? uh, Nelson is somebody who we've followed for a very long time. I've actually followed his activities since the 1980s, um, interestingly. Um, and uh, he certainly achieved some good results in some cases. Um, Procter & Gamble, I would put forward as a particular example of him achieving some pretty good results operationally at a company. Um, and I can run through what those are if anybody's interested in knowing what I think he did there and, and how it might work. And equally, he sometimes put forward proposals with regard to companies like PepsiCo, in fact, which we didn't applaud, uh, which were mainly seen to us about corporate uh, financial engineering and, uh, and splitting and so on and so forth, which we didn't go for. So I think he's got mixed results, Nelson. Um, I mean, since we're still shareholders, I wish him well. Um, I think if, I, if he's going to fail on this one, I think it would be because he's operating outside America. But bear in mind that when he achieved great results at Procter and Campbell, he was doing it in Cincinnati, which is where their headquarters uh, are. I mean, he's, whether or not he's able to achieve the same kind of results in a uh, European, and I do really mean European uh, culture in Unilever, I think is an open question. Um, how will it how will it achieve beyond that in this environment? Well, it's certainly defensive. You know, I mean, the the brands that they've got have a lot of defensive quality in there. You know, the biggest brand is Dove. Uh, the second biggest is Nor. Uh, these are pretty good defensive brands. Uh, but I'm not sure whether the management is sufficiently um, 
how can, how can I put it, uh, hard nosed at the moment to achieve the kind of um, action that you're going to need to keep ahead of, of what we've got in inflation at the moment. The sort of thing that I described for PepsiCo just now. This is uh, it's going to regard, you know, it's going to regard require a hell of a focus on uh, on costs and uh, and pricing uh, to keep ahead of this. So look, I'm. I'm neutral on it, as you probably guess from that. I'm I'm sounding like that the man that uh, the guy who said they wanted to hire a one-armed economist because it's on the one hand, on the other hand, and uh, I'm uh, I'm I'm kind of neutral. I I'm not got a very strong feeling on whether we should hold it or not at this point. Thanks, Terry. Uh, with valuations back at 2017 levels within the portfolio, mm. have there any new companies been added to the watch list to the investable universe, or is there anything on our radar? Yeah, I mean, we've just uh, we just added a few companies to the uh, to the watch list uh, or the investable universe, as, as you call it out there. I mean, uh, we ha we've added Adyen, the payments company, uh, to them, the European payments uh, processor. Atlas Coppo, Swedish manufacturer of, uh, of compressors and vacuum equipment, um, and Illinois Toolworks, uh, the uh, diversified uh, manufacturing business. Edwards Life Science Group. Uh, our corporation, which is the biggest manufacturer of uh, heart valves and uh, uh, equipment for procedures in that uh, area of, of endeavor, have all gone into the investable universe in recent times. I mean, partly because I mean, we don't really put things in the investable universe on price grounds, but more in terms of you know, we feel we've got to the point where we understand the business well enough to feel that we would want to own it in certain circumstances. I mean, there's certain circumstances I uh, certainly haven't got there with regard to Adyen yet because it's, I haven't looked up the rating uh, very recently, but the answer is it's still a hell of a lot. I'll look it up while we speak, just to tell you. I don't, don't think it's about to trouble the scorers in the very near future. Even if we got fed up with PayPal and sold it, um, uh, our friends over at Adyen are still on a PE of 91 as we speak. So uh, there may be a bit more catching up to do. And with regard to some of the others, and I would say probably Atlas Copco is in this um, camp and certainly Illinois Toolworks in this camp, what we probably will do with regard to those which we've added after a long period of time looking at them is wait for what's known uh, in sort of, uh, uh, you know, investment to parlance as a fat pitch. You know, if we are going into a significant economic downturn, these companies have a higher degree of economic sensitivity or, or um, uh, cyclicality than a number of other companies, certainly more than our consumer staples and probably our, uh, our main healthcare stocks. And uh, and therefore we might get a, the, a, the the market offering to uh, to sell us some stock in these companies at some really quite low ratings. So we're really eyeing them up from that possibility. So I would say with regard to those ones which have gone in, you know, watch this space in the next sort of uh, six to nine months if the economy takes the bath that people not unreasonably think it may. Thanks, Terry. I've got a quick question here on Salesforce, mm. with it being a leading cloud provider. Or is it a company that we've uh, considered given the huge discount that is on since the end of 2021? Um, yeah, look, we've looked at uh, a number of, uh, of, uh, of these things, ServiceNow, um, Salesforce, they're in different areas of, of endeavour here, but they are ones that we continually uh, have tried to assess. And um, I mean, Salesforce, I mean, we're users of it, apart from anything else, as you know, Peter, we're, uh, <laughs> we're, we're a user of the product. So it's, we're not unfamiliar with it from that uh, from that standpoint. It hasn't quite made it for us yet. I mean, it's still on a PE of 601, which is a little bit troublesome, um, obviously from a pricing standpoint. So I don't think you know, we need to reach a, a fundamental decision right on the spot anyway, because I don't think we're going to rush out and buy it. Um, and it, it kind of hasn't got there on other grounds at the moment. If I read the return on invested capital to you um, over the last, um, let's call it five years, 3.6, 4.8, 0 0.18, 5.4, 0 0.86. It, it's not getting there for us on this. It's got great margin structure at the moment, but at the moment there's no sign of it getting to the point where uh, the return on incremental capital invested is going to lift it out of the uh, out of the kind of returns that it's got historically and get the valuation to a point where we could actually consider it. Yeah. Okay, staying with tech. All the questions seem to be about tech, Terry. All right. Um, <laughs> what do you read into the announcements from Microsoft and Alphabet over the last couple of days about curbing employee hires? Is that going to have an impact on the growth of businesses? Uh, yeah, 
Yeah, I think a, a bit, but I don't actually regard it as particularly uh, material. Um, you know, it's look, when you go into uh, upturns of a sort that they had during the uh, the pandemic. Uh, I mean, we are talking about people who were, had to. I mean, they literally had to hire. I can't remember the numbers, but on average, between the companies that we look at, like Alphabet, Microsoft, Meta, they each had to hire fifty software engineers per day. Right just to keep pace with what was going on. Inevitably, uh, you know, as you face a bit of a downturn, I think that you're going to be uh, not hiring quite so many people. Uh, it's, there's no great surprise in that. I'm not sure why we should be shocked. And certainly the numbers that we are seeing don't look that bad. Of course, they might be the tip of an iceberg. There might be a lot more to come out there. Also, and I think this is more clear at some of these organizations than it is at others, uh, when you go through a period such as they had during the pandemic, when you probably get 10 years of transformation in 10 weeks or 10 months or something like that, uh, you know, some of your hiring can be a little bit indiscriminate. So I think there's an awful lot of weeding out going on amongst those organizations as well uh, during this period. So look, I, 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 as you know, Peter, I think people have said to me from time to time, oh, you invest in non-cyclical companies. And I've always said, well, I've been in work for 40, I'm trying to remember how many years, 48 years, I think it is this year, believe it or not. Um, and, uh, and I don't think I've ever found a non-cyclical company. We're talking about the degree of cyclicality. Do companies still have an adequate return on capital, cash generation and profitability at the bottom of the cycle? That's That's really what we're talking about. And I think it would be, uh, totally uh, predictable that these companies would experience some downturn in this and equally predictable that they'll all have great uh, performance in terms of the adequacy of the returns that they get at the bottom of the cycle. But one of the things that will happen on the way through is they'll hire less people and maybe even fire a few. Yeah, not surprising. Good. Thank you, Terry. Um, in the last webinar six months ago, you talked about the Amazon purchase and the business case behind that. Yeah. Are you still happy with that purchase? Still happy with that one, actually. Um, look, I think it's clear that they slightly overreached in terms of um, uh, the construction of infrastructure based upon uh, a little bit of extrapolation on what was going on during the downturn. But I think uh, they have corrected that very substantially, it seems to me, and are still in a, in a great position. Um, and that, uh, you know, they, they can and will produce very good returns in due course out of the retail business once that spend is no longer ongoing um, and in any event are still producing fantastic returns out of the amazon web services business and and uh, and out of the uh, the advertising business uh, that they've got i mean there are there's uh, no shortage of research out there which i don't particularly worry about myself about thinking about too much which which basically estimates that the the uh, the amazon web services business accounts for the whole of the valuation uh, on this one. So, you know, with that in mind, I think and knowing that they can produce Walmart type returns out of the retail business when they stop spending, but on a bigger business, I'm pretty OK with it. I mean, um, today, the the big focus is on the US CPI being up 9.1 percent. But I think you'll find that sort of average hourly earnings were down 4.4 percent. So I don't know what people think is going on out there, but I think you'll find that there might be I'm going to have a wild guess here. 4.4% less spent on uh, Prime Day than there was before you saw that statistic, basically, you know, because this is a pretty simple world, really. If people aren't earning it, then they're not running down savings. Where's it going to come from? And I think a bit of the boost historically, obviously, did come from running down savings. Um, the savings ratio got up to an enormous uh, level in the 30% during the pandemic when people couldn't go out couldn't go to a restaurant, couldn't go to a cinema and couldn't go on vacation um, and came out of that pretty uh, that, that plus, uh, you know, government um, furlong payments gave them some pretty interesting spending power. I, I think that's been largely exhausted now. So I think we will now see things move more more in trend with the average earnings and the average earnings are not going up at the moment. Thanks, Terry. Um, changing subjects slightly um, mm. onto Philip Morris International this time. Um, what do you make of the situation with Jewel in the US and could that have a long term positive for Philip Morris? Yeah, I mean, the, the Jewel situation is that they have a, um, uh, a, a situation where they have a, a current uh, agreement for distribution of the uh, of the iCost devices into North America uh, by Altria. Uh, and obviously, if they buy Swedish match, which it looks likely that they will do at the very least, they, then they have two possibities in terms of this. The, um, the Altria agreement and the um, 
uh, and the, um, the Swedish match one. Um, of course, they would have to find a way to abrogate the Altria agreement, although currently, debatably, the agreement is in brief of its um, performance conditions in any event. Um, and I think that if you add on to that the dual situation, there is a possibility that they could uh, get themselves into a position of uh, having, um, at the very least, uh, a, uh, a hold in the vape market, although they're not massively keen on it, combined with uh, their own distribution and the leading position in heat not burn and in nicotine pouches. And I think that's a powerful position. Uh, for them to find themselves in uh, if they get to uh, to be able to accomplish that, which I mainly think they will. I mean, obviously, the problem with vaping is that um, it's got a bad rep with regulators and others, um, justifiably to a considerable degree, in that it's being used by non-smokers and particularly underage or young non-smokers and is introducing them into the use of, uh, of nicotine. Um, and uh, obviously, that's not where Philip Morris has put his main pitch. Uh, their main pitch is uh, enabling existing smokers to transition into um, uh, into using a, a much less harmful product in the heat not burn product. I mean, the only thing I didn't mention about Swedish Match, assuming they pull it off, is it's the one smokeless product you can use in certain circumstances. You know, you you can't use a heat not burn or a, or a vaping device on an airplane, for example, whereas you can use a nicotine patch. Thanks, Terry. Um... Are you concerned of the economic sensitivity of Visa and MasterCard, or do you think they have enough pricing power and opportunities to ride out any downturn in consumer spending? Um, yeah, look, I think they can. Uh, I mean, we're talking about companies with, uh, never mind their gross margins, we're talking about companies with over 60% operating margins. Um, so I don't think we're going to see, uh, you know, sort of gut-wrenching declines in profitability, even if there is, as there may well be, a slowdown in, in spending, which, uh, which impacts them. So, no, I don't get terribly worried about it. And the other thing that I've become more comfortable with uh, in recent times than I might have been historically is the argument that, um, we're talking about them owning the quotes rails on which uh, an awful lot of, uh, of processing is done, partly because they have the infrastructure and they can do it well, partly for security reasons. So on. I mean, it's amazing the number of things that I use and maybe that you use as well to pay for things from time to time. And when you actually uh, get to the point of, of, of looking at what it really does, it, it directs something to your visa card. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, this is a pretty good set system. For, uh, for doing things. Um, plus, you know, um, an awful lot of what they're selling now is actually data solutions for other people who are trying to do uh, payment services within countries and so on. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm pretty relaxed about them. We don't own any MasterCard, as, as you probably know, but we do own Visa, yeah. Thanks, Terry. Um, we've always stated that we wouldn't own energy stocks. Does that also apply to sustainable energy? Uh, yeah, it does, um, because the reason we don't own energy stocks other than in our sustainable fund um, isn't one of uh, of concern about the environmental impact. It's the, it's the returns, uh, basically. And uh, I've yet to see these companies um, produce an adequate return. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in people who can produce adequate returns without government subsidy, since that's uh, that can be uh, changeable. Uh, shall we see? So, you know, the, the problem isn't isn't whether it's sustainable or not sustainable, at least with regard to the main fund. The problem the problem is that is whether or not it's got great returns. I mean, people uh, come to us with all kinds of propositions. The latest one I saw, which was a very interesting read, I might add, was a hydrogen fuel cell uh, drivetrain for uh, for vehicles, which I've got to say I am reasonably convinced is a much better solution uh, in terms of transport than, than battery powered electric vehicles um, for a variety of reasons, not least that you carry your power generation source with you. So range problems are obviated. Um, the downside of it is that there's no infrastructure at the moment in most places for the provision of hydrogen in gas stations, uh, whereas battery powered vehicles obviously can rely upon the existing grid and plug in somewhere to, to charge. But my problem in investing in it isn't whether or not I like the concept or whether or not I think it's better than the one that Toyota has already got or whether it's better than, uh, than BYD or Tesla or anybody else or Rivian. It's actually whether or not it'll ever make any money <laughs> that's the, or, or an adequate amount uh, for us. That's that's where my concerns about this are. Thanks. We have a recurring theme question here, Terry, from uh, webinars gone by. Yeah. Um, with a very big bookshelf, anything interesting to read this summer? Um, I'm actually, the, the book I'm reading at the moment is not in the bookshelf. Um, it's, uh, it's this book, uh, which I'll hold up to the camera so you can see what it is. That's where I am at the moment. 
Reinhardt and Rogoff's book, This Time It's Different, which looks at financial crises and in particular sovereign debt crises. Um, and uh, and it uh, looks at the, the history of that and the statistics on that. Very good read, actually. Not an easy read, but a very good read. So that's what I'm that's what I'm plowing through at the moment. Um, when I finish that, and as you can see, I'm about uh, about a third of the way through, if you look at the bookmark, um, then, uh, then I might move on to something a little lighter for the remainder of the summer, I think. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, quick question about Novo's uh, Wigovi um, and how serious a threat is Eli Lilly's weight loss drug, which I'm not going to pronounce. Yeah, don't, 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 don't bother trying. Um, I, I agree. Most of these things are, uh, are impossible to pronounce. Um, I don't think it's a threat at all. Um, if you look at the, the first of all, if you look at the clinical trials, it's definitely effective. Um, if you have to say where you think that it might be problematic, um, it's got higher side effects a bit in terms of nausea um, than regularly. But for what it's worth, if you said to me, Terry, uh, never mind that, I want you to tell me whether you think this is going to get through uh, and uh, become, yeah, I think it's going to get through and become a commercial success. But the idea that a single company would have a monopoly of world weight loss drugs is preposterous. I, I think actually what the Eli Lilly drug will end up being is a, a market expander. Uh, no pun intended, um, as opposed to a waistline expander uh, is. Um, and I, look, I think there's bound to be more than one, just as there are in, uh, you know, in human insulins and semaglutides. There's not a monopoly. There never will be a monopoly uh, in these things. I think it's, uh, you know, people see these things always as a threat. Um, I actually see them as, yeah, well, then people will be able to prescribe one or other, won't they? And it will probably be prescribed depending upon your um, uh, the patient's uh, degree of reaction to the uh, to potential side effects in the drug. Yeah, I mean, look, the science behind this is complex, but the uh, but the, the practicalities of it are much less complex, which is to say, unsurprisingly, you might not be shocked that something that induces weight loss, one of its potential side effects is nausea. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so crystal ball time, do you think we've reached the bottom of the market yet? Uh, no, I don't think we have. No, no, it doesn't feel to me like we've had capitulation or whatever we want to call it yet. Um, uh, I, like, I, I don't like the crystal ball very much because I don't think mine's very good. But um, I have seen something like this before. But even then, it only rhymes. It's not the same. I, I would go with. I think that this, this. I mean, this, this piece of inflation has has come like, almost like a bolt from the blue. It's very quick and very, very sharp. You know, we've gone almost from a standing start to ten percent inflation. Kaboom! Right. And I think uh, uh, Lord King's, um, uh, as he is, uh, quote that I put in my uh, semi-annual letter is rather a good one, that this was born of a misstep in monetary policy, which is to say, um, you know, monetary policy was, uh, we had further quantitative easing in the pandemic, um, and the problems of the pandemic had nothing to do with excess uh, the inflation isn't born of excess demand. Normally, it's born of excess demand in an economy. Economy gets overheated gradually. You know, people get bid up for wages. People use the money they get from that to go and buy more houses, and so. On. And gradually, what we get is excess demand and increased prices. And no blind. This wasn't born of that. It wasn't born of that. It was born of supply chain difficulties, including the supply of labour, supply chain for for goods and and, and for labour, um, and um, uh, you know everything from commodities to semiconductors and so on. And so the policy response was almost certainly the wrong one uh, in terms of further laxity. And I think we may well find that the, the as the supply chain corrects and demand begins to fall, um, the two overshoot in opposite directions, and we find we've gone from a too lax. Um, a monetary policy to uh, to a too tight one, and uh, and therefore you know we'll have to reverse all engines. But by then there'll be damage done in terms of the economy. So, I I think we are still some way off from seeing all of that, and the market itself doesn't uh, doesn't reek of capitulation. So no, I don't think we have uh, have reached the bottom. Um, but in terms of what we own, the picture I'm painting for you there is I suppose if you said well what will that look like? Well, uh, short term rates will continue going up. Yep. Uh, longer term rates may not climb quite as much as because the, the bond market may begin to sense that that what I'm describing is correct and the um, and the, therefore you know the short term interest rates is going to kill them more than kill the inflationary impulse in which case the valuation headwind will abate or even reverse and then we're just dealing with a recession and if I if there are any circum economic circumstances in which I feel pretty confident about our relative performance it would be a recession given the sort of stuff that we own. Uh, out there. But uh, uh, nonetheless, 
you know, as they say, when uh, when the police raid the Baldy House, even the piano player gets arrested. Um, and if the market's going to go down further, I'm sure we'll join it, uh, basically. I don't think we're going to be immune. Thanks, <laughs> Terry. Um, you've mentioned a couple of the holdings in the portfolio, such as PayPal and Unilever, that don't excite you. Mm. What's in there that does excite you? What, what does excite me? Yeah. So, um, well, I mean, some of the companies that I mentioned earlier to you, I think, excite me in terms of ones that are in our IU. I think we may get better opportunities to buy them, but I think Atlas, Copco, and Illinois Tool are both very good, uh, somewhat more cyclical industrial businesses than, uh, than, than the generality of our portfolio, but they're very good. Um, it was life sciences. Uh, excites me um, out there, I, you know, and there are some other opportunities, I think, within the IU that I think are exciting. And within what we've got, I mean, there's some stuff. I still like our cosmetics businesses a lot. I think the Brown Foreman still has a lot to make up. I'd like to buy a lot more Metal of Toledo when I get the opportunity, when there's another uh, poor period during the market. I'd probably like to buy some more Adobe as well, I think. Um, so, you know, I've got two or three things within the portfolio that excite me and two or three things outside the portfolio that excite me as well. Um, and part of what I guess we will be doing, which is what we always do, but we may see more opportunity for it in the next few months, is waiting to see how things relatively move. How do things like PayPal, Meta and Unilever move against Atlas, Copco, uh, Metla Toledo, uh, Adobe, Edwards Life Science and, uh, uh, and, and so on to see where uh, an opportunity arises, because that's part of it. Part of it is a price gap opens up one way or another. Thanks, Terry. Just when you mentioned Adobe there, someone threw a question, why do you like Adobe? So I thought I'd uh, ask that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, sure. I mean, it's it's the undoubted leader in what it does uh, in terms of software. There's no doubt about that. It's, you know, I'm, I wouldn't have thought there's any of us that don't daily use uh, Adobe product. Uh, basically. So it's definitely that. Um, I think that there's a very long, I don't like this phrase, runway ahead of all that. The number of things that we currently see represented to us uh, pretty much in hard copy um, that will end up being represented to us uh, in terms of computer graphics and that will therefore be you know, real time and changeable, I think will grow as time goes by. I mean, just think about the simplest level. You know, how many, when I drive along the road, how many road signs do I see uh, which are in pressed metal uh, versus the ones that, uh, that flash at me and tell me which part of the N25 is closed and whether or not I'm speeding uh, and various things. I, I think I know where the trend lies there, yeah? I'm fairly sure I know where the trend lies. And so I think, and not just in that, but in, in a lot of things, I think it's got a, a leading position, a very big runway, probably a somewhat unrecognized business uh, in the uh, in the digital advertising business. Whereas I say, you know, people generally think of a, a duopoly between Alphabet and, uh, and, and Meta, and they're not wrong, uh, but they're not in cloud right either. I mean, there's some other punchy players out there at a, at a somewhat smaller level at the moment, like Amazon and Adobe, which I think they've got good businesses. And if you just look through the operating metrics, uh, I'm looking at 2021 metrics here, gross margin 88%, uh, operating margin 37%, uh, return on invested capital, uh, 27%. I mean, this is clearly a pretty good business. And I'm I'm, I'm looking at 2021, but frankly, I, I could go back some years and, you know, go back to 2018 and read you some pretty similar numbers off this chart, right? This is a clearly a very good business, uh, basically. Thanks, Terry. Time for one last question. Mm. Um, and uh, we're being asked if you can comment at all on the Section 166 order from the FCA. Uh, well, of course, the literal uh, and easy reply to that is no. Um, you know, uh, our uh, our relationship with our regulator are and should be confidential. Um, and therefore, I can't even confirm that any such thing exists. Um, but you'd have seen press on it, probably, which otherwise there wouldn't be a question on it, would there? So I will say this. If, if such a thing existed, and please note the word, the most important word that I've just said is if, <laughs> um, then it might not be that shocking that it exists. And the reason I say that is we operate the biggest retail fund in the UK now. And there's clearly been a big problematic uh, incident in regard to retail funds in the UK in La Faire Woodford, in which, by the way, we still await the outcome in terms of a report on the on the whole matter, uh, which I suspect is not going to make for um, pleasant reading. Um, and so if you put those two things together, it's hardly, su hardly surprising if our regulator would probably like to know a bit more about us um, 
uh, and perhaps historically they might have done. And the Section 166 process is an interesting process for regulators to accomplish that for a couple of reasons. One is it enables them to appoint somebody uh, outside, a so-called skilled person from one of the uh, major account accounting or consultancy firms to do the work so that they don't have calls on their regular manpower to do it. And secondly, and this is quite important, we would foot the bill. Uh, so in many respects, I think from the standpoint, if I were running uh, asset management regulation at the F FCA, I, I would really rather query why we didn't just do this all the time uh, as a means of doing it. Um, uh, and obviously, as I said, I'm not in, in a position to confirm or deny that, it, that any such thing ever occurred. But there's been some press this week about speculation that the process may have ended. Um, and uh, if that were right, then it would be interesting because obviously nothing has happened subsequent to that in terms of... Uh, uh, any kind of action. So, uh, you know, that's uh, I, uh, the most important word I've said, as I've said, I, I can't comment an if. Okay. Thank you, Terry. Thank you very much. Um, we will draw to a close at that point, uh, just conscious of time. Thank you very much for your time today, Terry. Very Pleasure. informative. And thank Pleasure. everybody for attending. To all the team at Fundsmith, thank you for this very interesting presentation. Our team of advisors at MeDirect are always available if you have any further questions. Further information on the fund discussed can also be found on our website www.medirect.com.mt.